guys, it's Oli London and I am here today in the beautiful city of Istanbul, Turkey. I'm here because I'm undergoing my very latest procedures and I'm so excited for you guys to see the results. I'm finally making my dreams come true of completing my K-pop idol look and looking like Jimin, I'm going to be having a canteplasty, which is an eye procedure to make my eyes more beautiful, more Korean, more K-pop just like Jimin and I will also be going undergoing a brow lift as well just to give me that kind of more beautiful defined look around my eye as a Korean woman but six months later he's decided he's had enough now he's tr transitioning back to being a British man we thought we would ask him what that experience was like Ollie London joins us tonight Ollie London thanks so much for coming on um, so why did you decide to become a Korean woman who told you that was possible so obviously I've had a difficult time with my gender identity struggles. I was never unhappy with how I looked. So I started changing, I started dressing as a Korean woman and I realized that was a big mistake and I just want to be a boy. But you know, is it any wonder people like me and young people want to change their gender when we have the normalization of this in our schools in this country? Children are taught from a young age, from the age of five in some cases, that it's okay to change their gender. It's okay to, you know, wear a skirt. It's okay for a boy to use a gender neutral toilet when it puts girls at risk. This is the new norm and schools are teaching about toxic masculinity. They're eroding the alpha male, the alpha straight male has been eroded. You know, Tucker, what happened years ago when kids used to go to school, they used to idolize Superman and astronauts. Now kids are being pushed this radical ideology. They're taught to idolize weak men like Harry Styles, weak politicians like Beto O'Rourke. Why is this happening, you know? And is it any wonder people like me fall victim to this, that I had all this surgery, I tried to change, because, you know, I, I kind of fell victim to this mentality. I'm an adult, but you know, these kids can't make these decisions on their own. They're, be they're being pushed this radical agenda. And I'm grateful that I've come out the other side. I'm grateful I found God. But you know, I want to speak up for these kids that are confused with their gender. A lot of kids have gender dysphoria. And you know, that wasn't a thing 20 years ago, Tucker. This is what Social media star Ollie London, who has had over 30 cosmetic surgeries and was living as a transgender woman for six months, recently found God, as well as found his way of appreciating the man he was created to be. I'm Drea Humphrey with Rebel News, and today I sit down to interview Ollie about his detransitioning story, as well as some messages he has for children who are experiencing gender dysphoria or questioning whether or not they have that. And I also speak to him about how he is being treated or accepted by the trans community he was once a part of. All right, Ali London, the singer, the social media star. Thank you so much for being on Rebel News today. Thank you. It's a real pleasure. And hi to everyone in Canada. Well, you've been through a lot recently. You've had a lot of achievements over time. And more recently, you've gone through a lot physically, uh, emotionally. And spiritually, you are a man who is detransitioning. Why don't you tell us, we'll start with what made you get to that path right now that you're on today? So um, for the last six months, I became trans. And, you know, that really stemmed from identity issues I've had since I was a child. Um, so now I'm back living to my biological self, back to being me and trying to find the real me through um, God and through finding myself. Um, but yeah, really, my journey began as a teenager. Um, when I would be at school, I would get bullied a lot for my appearance. Um, I would just get a lot of abuse and nasty comments just about the way I looked. Um, my face looked completely different back then. So it really knocked my self-esteem it really knocked my confidence and just made me feel bad every time I look in the mirror so some days I would try and make myself uh, be sick so I wouldn't have to go to school I'd physically throw up so I would get a day off from school because I would just be scared people would tease me um, and I'd have really bad skin problems like acne I'd have redness all over my nose so that's really where it began um, so initially I actually had my first surgery in South Korea in 2013 and I was living there for a year and uh, Korea is like the plastic surgery capital of the world. Yeah. You can't you can't really avoid surgery there. It's like it's so in your face. Um, it's like so heavily advertised on billboards, on shop fronts, um, or, you know, on television. All the K-pop idols look so perfect. Um, so it's very tempting for anyone that goes to Korea. Um, and it's, it's just very accessible. So, yes, yeah, so I had my first surgery. I, I wanted to change my nose because that was the thing that I used to get bullied about the most. Um, my nose was very, very big before. Um, so, yeah, I 
did my first surgery, changed the nose. And that was all I was planning. I was thinking, let me just get a nice nose and I will be happy. Mm -hmm. But what happened is the nose surgery went really, really wrong. Um, the I had a silicone implant and they actually put me under local anesthetic uh, mm -hmm. when it should have been general anesthetic. So when they were actually cutting my nose up, I could hear like the chisel. I could hear the saw. It was like crazy. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Yeah, so that was a bad experience. So then I had that surgery, it went wrong. So then I had to get a few more correctional surgeries. And then it kind of went from there. I kept thinking, you know, I can self-improve. I can make myself look better. But still, I got to a point earlier this year where I've now had 32 surgeries and I wasn't happy. I was really, really unhappy. I'm thinking, maybe I feel like I'm trapped in the wrong body. Maybe I feel like I would look better as a woman or as a trans woman. Um, so then I had facial feminization surgery, which included I had my forehead bones, my eyebrow bones shaved to make it uh, more feminine. I had my hairline lowered. And, you know, I'm absolutely covered in scars. Um, but, you know, so I then thought maybe I, I feel better looking like a woman. So I had the feminization. I had hair extensions. I started wearing dresses. Um, you know, I even went out in public to Cannes Film Festival on the red carpet. I wore a pink dress. Um, and I just, you know, I was thinking, is this the real me? And then I was thinking, I'm not happy. Why am I not finding happiness? Um, so I really have come to realize I had gender dysphoria. Um, I literally was just confused about my identity. I think just stemming from my appearance. Um, and yeah, I started going to church a few months ago at a time when I was feeling very lost and confused and I needed some direction in my life. Um, and yeah, and I just walked into a Catholic church one day and sat at the back, listened to the priest deliver the service, um, spoke to the priest afterwards and just started going back ever since. And uh, that really helped me. It made me realize, you know, all of this is pointless. You know, what's the point? All this surgery, all these changes, I'm left with scars. It's not giving me fulfillment. It's not giving me happiness. Mm -hmm. I just need to get back to the real me. You know, I'm born a biological male. You know, I know you can't change your genders. I, You know, I support everyone in their decision of how they want to live. But, you know, even when I was trans, I would always respect women. I wouldn't use the restrooms, the locker rooms um, with women. So it was, you know, it was just an identity struggle I had. But um, thankfully, I've you know come out the other side and trying to share my story to help um, teens, you know, across yeah. North America that um, will be struggling with gender dysphoria. I'm just wondering, how are you being accepted? How are you accepted when you decided that you were going to be a trans woman versus how you're being accepted now as a detransitioning man? Well, it's very interesting. Like I did describe on Twitter the trans movement as a cult because it really is like a cult. So, you know, they, as soon as you become trans, you announce you're trans, they're so accepting. They welcome you with loving arms. You know, they celebrate you. They think you're a hero, you're a champion. So they give you all that kind of positive reinforcement, which again is what cults do. You know, they bring someone and they give you that, you know, when you're in a vulnerable position, they give you that positive reinforcement. You join the cult. And then, you know, when I realized it's just not for me, I just have gender dysphoria. I need to get back to myself. You know, I, I shared that online because I thought maybe there's other kids, you know, that might be struggling. Maybe I can help them. And the amount of abuse I got from the trans lobby was just horrific. You know, uh -huh. I'm 32 years old. I'm, unfortunately, I'm used to the abuse. You know, I do TikTok. I do social media. I'm, I'm very used to it. But, uh, you know, imagine if you're a 16-year-old child. Yeah. And, you know, there's many cases in America. There's a girl called Chloe Cho. She de uh, she's detransitioned back to her biological self. And she gets, she was showing on Twitter the DM she gets, the abuse she gets, the death threats mm -hmm. she gets. Thinking, these are children. These are children in a vulnerable position. Mm -hmm. They are sharing their detransition and they are met with death threats, abuse, harassment, trying to silence and intimidate them. And I'm thinking, you know, that just discourages people from detransitioning. That discourages people from talking about it. And, you know, we should be having a dialogue because this is, mm -hmm. you know, this is, an abuse of children and the trans movement, the trans cult is pushing these, like you said, rapid gender ideologies on kids and it's it's changing them. So, you know, I got a lot of abuse, but I got some beautiful messages on the other side from the Christian community, people across America and Canada, just, you know, and I had a lot of parents saying, you know, their kids have gender dysphoria, they need advice. They're really at a point where they're stuck and, you know, the teachers at school are telling them, telling their kids, you know, without the parents knowing, they're telling their kids, oh, it's okay to change your gender, you should have puberty blockers, you know, they're telling kids this. And, you know, kids are so young, they're so impressionable, they just go along with whatever someone in authority tells them. So if a teacher tells them that's normal, if their classmates say that's normal, if TikTok, you know, TikTok stars like Dylan Mulvaney say it's normal, <laughs> the kids just go along with it. And, you know, they don't realize the devastating consequences it has on their body and also their mental health. 
Yeah. Well, I don't know if you know this, but in Canada, there's also laws preventing what they call conversion therapy. But it also just means that if, you know, someone decides that they possibly are not transgender and want to switch out of that, they can't really seek advice on that. Um, Were you able to find advice in that area? Was it hard to do? Did you rely on your new church to do that? Or what happened there? So there's really no resources out there to help people that um, want to detransition or want to get back to their biological self. There's no help out there whatsoever because, you know, anyone that tries to help, anyone that speaks out is silenced by the trans lobby. So which which is very bad because, you know, you have uh, hundreds of thousands of kids in uh, America alone that have gender dysphoria and they've been clinically diagnosed with this from doctors. And, you know, they have no support. It's, they have all the support in the world if they want to transition. They have access to hormone replacement therapy, puberty blockers. But if they want to detransition, there's absolutely no support. Um, so it's very, very hard for a child to kind of find the help out there. And, and that's really, really why I wanted to speak up, because I'm thinking, you know, let me be a voice for these people. Let me help them come out and share their story. You know, I'm happy taking the abuse. You know, I'm so used to it. And for- yeah. unfortunately, I'm used to it because of um, my TikTok and Twitter and stuff, you know. I would rather take that abuse so they don't have to go through that. You know, if I can start the dialogue and, you know, start giving uh, these kids an outreach where they can talk about their issues and talk about their struggles, you know, then I feel that's helping. But yeah, for me personally, it was, um, there was no support out there. It was just going to church and, you know, meeting, you know, really nice Christians, you know, at the church. Everyone was very friendly, very welcoming, Mm -hmm. kind real sense of community and a sense of belonging. Um, the priest, you know, was very positive. And of course, the teachings of the Bible, you know, what Jesus used to do when he would cleanse the leper when no one else would help the leper. You know, there's some really great teachings in there. So I feel that for me personally was enough to help me get through this, um, you know, but otherwise I would have just been lost. There's, there's really no resources out there.